He just likes that whistling sound. That's all it is. <laughs> Only to your wife. I talk about for me. Oh. <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. We're missing a few folks this morning because everybody's gone on vacation, and that's understandable. And the only person I know of that's sick is Debbie Hooten. She's not doing well this morning. Uh, my daughter is not doing well, so they're not here. Also, James Hutchison is back in rehab, if you haven't heard that. Uh, he thinks he'll be out Tuesday, be able to go back home Tuesday, so... But they got the blood clots removed, which is a good thing. So I want to continue to remember them. And, of course, Jack and Pat are here this morning. Jack's still recovering from his surgery. Jim Dunaway is still struggling. Uh, he's going to have another surgery in mid-August. So we want to remember him as well. So, Myron, do you feel like leading us in prayer this morning? Sure. Let's pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. Thank you for uh, this day that you've given us. Thank you for your son, uh, who we have gathered around to worship and, and study and, and learn more about uh, him and you, Father. Uh, we pray that as we go through this study, Lord, that we may focus our hearts and minds on, on what we have uh, here. And, uh, <clears throat> and that we can continue to learn more about your word, Father, and hide it in our hearts to be able to use it and employ it uh, to those that we come in contact with. We may, may we be an encouragement to each other and to those who we surround ourselves with, Father, and that we can bring more souls to you, Lord. Thank you. We love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. I got to thinking about it, and I wrote three words here on the board, and uh so I thought we'd discuss those three words because we're talking about <clears throat> our conscience and how our conscience helps us in growing spiritually. And obviously we want to grow spiritually. But turn your Bibles first to 1 Timothy, if you will, chapter 3 and verse 9. That's what we have up here. A good conscience is a pure conscience, okay? And uh, so what we're going to be talking about here, a pure conscience is not one mixed up or defiled by wrongdoing. Uh, it is one willing to suffer wrong to remain pure. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 9. We'll read verses 8 and 9 to have the full picture of it. This is talking about deacons and their qualifications, okay? But it's important to see exactly what Paul had to say about the deacons. He says, Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. A pure conscience. So, the question I have with these three words here, uh, what would be the definition of conscience in your mind? That you're doing your job well. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, if you want the biblical definition of conscience, it is a judgment of reason by which we determine whether an action is right or wrong. If you remember in John, the 14th chapter, verse 15, Jesus was speaking to his apostles and he said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Uh, the American Standard Version just simply says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I like that. Uh, because of the fact that if we have a pure conscience, we will keep His commandments. We deepen our relationship with God by following Him, and in doing so, we become more fully ourselves. Uh, the goal of a good conscience is void of all offense. Uh, we're told in Acts the 24th chapter, verse 16, if you want to turn there, Acts 24, verse 16, Jesus, or, or Paul was speaking at that time. And I think all of us are fair, fairly familiar with what Paul said there. He said, therefore, I do my best always to have a clear conscience toward God and all people. The term means 
having nothing for one to strike against and not causing to stumble. Okay? That's basically the biblical definition of conscience. But how about integrity? What does the word integrity mean to you? Nola? I was on conscience. Oh, on conscience? There are two kinds of conscience. Okay. There's the worldly conscience and there's God's conscience. True. And I thought we were um, moral people. You know, we had good consciences. But I found out there are things that we didn't follow because we weren't godly. I just, that's all I want to say. Okay. All right. Uh, so, integrity. What's it mean to you? And does it correlate with conscience? Or is it one and the same? Diane? Honesty. Honesty, okay. Someone you can trust. You can trust, okay. Moral uprightness. Moral uprightness, all right. So let's look at the biblical definition of integrity. And actually, there's two. Old Testament and New Testament, okay? In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word translated integrity means the condition of being without blemish. It means completeness. It means perfection, sincerity, soundness, uprightness, and wholeness. But in the New Testament, integrity means honesty and adherence to a pattern of good works. All right. So you see the similarity between integrity and conscience? How about morality? What do you see in morality? If one talks about someone's morals or their morality, what are we talking about? Their nature. Their nature, okay. Ethics. Do what, Don? Ethics. Ethics, okay. Your speech and action is usually good. All right. All right. So, the Christian moral code, defined by the Christian Bible, is the standard of right and wrong that was established by Jesus Christ and then taught by His disciples. It is based on two foundations. One, loving God. And two, loving people. The Christian moral code has had enormous influence in Western civilization. And that's the similarity of these three words. And if we're going to grow spiritually, then we must have all three of these words in our life. Okay? So, <clears throat> when we talk about a good conscience is a pure conscience, which I have up here, uh, and we looked at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9. Uh, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 19. First Peter chapter 2. And if you look at uh, verse 19, Peter says, For this is commendable, if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. And so indeed we see a good conscience is indeed a pure conscience. Turn to Romans, the 14th chapter, if you will. And let's look at what Paul said to the church at Rome. Romans, the 14th chapter. And let's begin at, uh, well, verse 22 is good. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. So again, we're talking about one's conscience. And what kind of conscience do you have? What kind of conscience do I have? Uh, 
Let me ask, does anyone need a copy of this lesson? I think. Anyone else need a copy? All right, so. And we'll finish up this lesson. I'll give handout lesson three this morning as well. So, we are warned not to encourage or even force one to go against their conscience. A man is blessed if his conscience approves of what he does. The Apostle Paul said, I am of clear conscience before and after. We've talked about this before. Paul thought he was doing right when he was crucifying Christians because he felt that the Christian movement was a cult. And it was against the Jewish religion. And Paul, being a Jew, a very devout Jew, was trying to stop this cult. And so he had a clear conscience about what he was doing. And he had a clear conscience about what he was doing after Christ came to him on the road to Damascus. And Paul realized that the position he held before was wrong, and now that he has another position. So he has a clear conscience. So the idea is a man is blessed if his conscience approves of what he does. But if a man has reservations about doing something, but does it anyway, he is indeed defiling his conscience. We need to do only what we believe to be right. This is what Paul did. And this is, as Christians, if we're going to grow spiritually, we need to do what is right. Now, how can we do what is right? First off, we have to know what is right, don't we? We're going to say with a good conscience, we know right from wrong. Exactly right. And the more we study the Bible, the better understanding we have of what is right, don't we? And so that's how we can grow spiritually, by knowing what God expects of us. All right, so let's see if he got this fixed. He did. <laughs> so how to have a corrupted or defiled conscience. And the first thing I have up there, a defiled conscience comes from having a weak conscience. And I think we all understand that. But let's see what Paul said to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians, if you will. <coughs> and we want to look at chapter 8. He's talking about things offered to idols at this point. And beginning in verse 7, he says, However, there is not in everyone that knowledge, for some with consciousness of the idol, until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not condemn, commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware, lest someone, or somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. And we also know that Paul told the church at Corinth, he said, you know, if any meat would cause my brethren to stumble, what would you do? He would refrain from eating meat. We have to accept the fact that some people are weaker than other people. And as Christians, we can cause someone to actually leave the church because of the position we take unless we understand that they have a weaker position and it's our opportunity to help study with them to ha help them have a greater appreciation of what God expects. And so that's the idea behind all of this. Uh, so obviously a defiled conscience comes from having a weak conscience. The idea is to go against or violate one's conscience will make it weak. People who were not fully convinced about eating meat offered to idols did not act of conviction, but they acted out of weakness. They went on and ate anyway, thus defiling their conscience. So a weak conscience then functions poorly in controlling our impulses. 
We tend to give in too easily. We need to remove as many tempting situations as possible until our conscience is stronger. And we must learn to forego immediate gratification of desires for those that are wholesome and we need to be considerate of the rights and the wishes of others. So, look at what Paul said to Titus in Titus the first chapter. And we're going to look at verse 15. Again, talking about the qualifications and duties of elders here. Here Paul says, To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So that's the idea of a weak conscience. And of course, a defiled conscience or a weak conscience, con conscience comes from having, uh, being weak. Any comments or thoughts? You know, this just kind of goes hand in hand. A person with a good conscience has a good heart. That's true. That's true. A person who has a good conscience wants the best for everybody, mm -hmm. doesn't he? And, and that is the idea behind, behind uh, faithful Christianity. We want the best for each and every individual. For the deal? Yes. Well, and then that's one of the things that, because I remember growing up, you used to always hear about the golden rule. But nowadays, you don't hear that. That's and true. one of the things that I try to remind people who I do come in contact with is, is Besides being the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Jesus said, "The second is, is like unto it: Thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself." And I feel like that if people would really learn to apply that, then that would help you know address a lot of issues that we face. Yeah. With those two commandments that Jesus gave there, basically what he was doing was taking the ten commandments and reducing them down to two commandments, and. Uh, Faithful Christians fully understand that, and they want the best for everybody. So, a, any other comments? Yes, Kathy. That brought about what James Cope said in a lesson about who is your neighbor. And so he talked about the three different uh, philosophies where his mind is right. The second philosophy was the silver rule. You do me no harm, I'll do you no harm. And then, of course, God's rule, which is what Arthel brought up. Yeah, yeah. The iron reel, the sil silver, uh, iron reel, the silver reel, and the golden reel. I've heard many a sermons on that. In fact, I've even preached a sermon on it. Good point, Kathy. All right, so a corrupted conscience can be a seared or hardened conscience. Uh, what we mean by that is a person who goes against his conscience for a period will bring about a hardened conscience. Uh, he refuses to be guided by his conscience. And such will become slaves to sin when you get right down to it. Uh, turn to 1 Timothy, if you will, and let's look at, at what Paul said to Timothy in chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2. He's talking about the walk of the good minister of Jesus Christ, the faithful Christian of Jesus Christ. He says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to bury and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who who believe and know the truth. Now, if you think back about what Paul is saying to Timothy here, you can go all the way back to Peter's example here, where uh, God sent down all the creatures and everything and told Peter to eat. 
And Peter said, not so, Lord. I don't eat any un unclean things. But what did God say? Exactly right. He said, call nothing I created unclean. And so the idea here is that if we do certain things that violates our conscience, eventually our conscience will become hardened to the point that we ignore everything in life. Uh, we go our own way. We refuse to accept the Word of God. Uh, turn with me to uh, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, if you will. We're not going to read Proverbs 30, verse 20, uh, but we will look at Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And in this fourth chapter, Beginning with verse 17, we're talking about the walk of the believer as a new man in Christ. Okay? So what Paul says to the church at Ephesus, he said, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having therefore understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. So, <clears throat> turn over to Isaiah, the 59th chapter, if you will. And here beginning in verse 9. What the 59th chapter is talking about is the tragic nature of sin. Okay? So rather than look at all of it, we'll begin at verse 9 where Isaiah says, Therefore justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as a twilight. We are as dead men in desolate places. We all growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you. And our sins testify against us, for our transgressions are with us. And as for inequities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord, and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering for, from the heart words of falsehood, just is, justice is turned back, and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. So, this is the idea of a corrupted conscience that can be a seared or hardened conscience. Any thoughts? All right. So, a corrupted conscience becomes an evil conscience then. Such a conscience needs to be cleansed by the grace of God. The Hebrew writer, which there are many arguments as to who the Hebrew writer was, I feel it was probably the Apostle Paul. What I don't understand is why this one letter that was written, why he did not identify himself. There may be several explanations why he did not identify himself. Remember who he was writing to in the letter to the Hebrews. These were <coughs> second generation Hebrew Christians. They still held that Moses was a great man. They felt angels were superior. They leaned on their high priest. And if you look at the first few chapters of the book of Hebrews, 
Uh, the Hebrew writer is explaining to them that Christ is superior to Moses. Christ is superior to the angels. Christ is superior to the high priest because he is a high priest. He even compares Jesus Christ to Melchizedek. Which the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about Melchizedek, but when we get into Hebrews, there are some things about him that we need to fully appreciate. But here in the Hebrew, in the tenth chapter of Hebrews, and looking at verse, there ain't no yeah, 22. do what? There ain't no <laughs> Hebrews 10, 22. There's a 22. Oh, I'm in Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> You're just trying to confuse me, aren't you guys? <laughs> I've made mistakes before. <laughs> okay. Uh, beginning in verse 19, he's talking about the life of faith, okay? <clears throat> and he says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way by uh, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is in that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So the idea is that if we're going to avoid having an evil conscience, we need to have a pure conscience. We need to uh, be cleansed by the grace of God. And that's what the Hebrew writer is saying here. Any comments? Yes. Well, and going back to, like he says, well, how do you get that, you know, pure conscience? And if you, you remind me of how people forget that Christianity is a taught religion. It's not something that just hits you overnight. It's something that just you have to be taught. It's just like how we were when we were children. We had to be taught what was right and wrong. And then eventually we had to make the choice that, okay, are we going to continue to follow what we've been taught or are we going to depart from it? Okay. All right. And, you know, it goes back to what the proverb writer says when he said, train up a child in the way he ought to go and he will not depart from the way. Good parents will train their children properly. That's how we develop a conscience. If we're properly trained, we know right from wrong. Now, we're not talking about, in this situation, uh, our faith in the Bible, but we're talking about knowing right from wrong. How to treat mankind. How to treat one another. And <clears throat> not only do parents train us with our conscience, they also train us with integrity and our morality. So that when we grow up, we understand these things. And it helps us at a, as a beginning point to have a better understanding of why it's important for us to study the Word of God and to have a better understanding of what God expects for us. Because good parents will instill that into their children as well. Now, we're all given free choice. And because we're given free choice, the majority of the world will go about the way of the world. But good, faithful Christians will accept the choice that they want to follow God and do God's will. And so <clears throat> that's how we have a clear conscience. That's how we grow our conscience. Uh, but we need to understand that a conscience can become corrupted by an over-righteous or overly strict outlook. It is talking about, uh, when you look at Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter, <clears throat> And verse 16. If someone has that, read that for me real quick. Let me say something. Yes, Jack. A, a biblical or spiritual conscience will help you to help, be, want to help your Christian brothers and do things for them, especially if your son's sick or anything, do things for them. A person can have a good, clear conscience that's not biblical or spiritual just by being a good person. But they are more apt to get corrupted yes. down the line than this, than one of the That's very true. Good point. Any other comments? All right, someone read Ecclesiastes 7 and 16 for me, please. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Okay. So what the Ecclesiastes writer is talking about here is 
he is talking about going to extremes that do harm or hurt us uh, or hurts the Lord's cause. Such people can make everyone miserable around them. And these are the kind of people that we really don't want to be around, aren't, isn't it? Uh, My mom called that dead right. Okay, good point. Yeah. All right, so I already have it up on the screen here, but we want to talk about a clean conscience. And a clean conscience is one that has been purged of its wrongdoing. Uh, when you look at the Hebrew writer in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, and you look at verse 14 specifically, he says, well, let's go back and look at verse 13. It says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So, <clears throat> the consciousness of wrongdoing has been forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We no longer need to feel guilty but we should be thankful for what Christ has done for us. The older I get, the more I think about that story, about the sacrifice that he made. And I always think about the fact that as I was younger, I didn't really appreciate so much of what Christ has done for me. But I cannot imagine anybody who would go through the pain and the agony and the suffering that he went through for the sins of the world. Not knowing that people would accept that sacrifice, but doing it out of pure love for mankind. Knowing that his father, God, said that there will always be a remnant of faithful Christians. The sad thing about it is it's the remnant is few in numbers. But Christ made the sacrifice that everybody might have that opportunity. And I would ask this, how many of us would be willing to make that kind of sacrifice for mankind? Would be willing to suffer in that way? Would be willing to actually have your flesh torn from your body with the whipping that he endured and to be willing to have your hands and feet nailed to the cross. There is no comparison of what man can do according to what Jesus did. That's very but true. Man don't have it. It is said that the crucifixion was the most humiliating <coughs> form of punishment that they could implore upon mankind. And yet, there are examples in the Bible. In fact, if you go to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the faith chapter, and you look at the latter part of the Hebrews 11th chapter, you see much of the punishment that Christians endured at that time. It said that if you fully appreciate that they used saws made out of wood that literally killed people by cutting them in half, sawing them in half. And yet faithful Christians continue to fight for God. And that's why it's important that you look at the 8th <coughs> chapter of Acts. And you see Saul consenting to Stephen's death. And because of that, Christians were scattered abroad. And even though they were scattered abroad, they continued to go everywhere preaching the Word of God. Yes? Well, and I was also thinking about how both Stephen and Jesus had the same same mindset. When Jesus was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen, before he died, said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. To show you that, like you said, he still had that same 
love for them regardless of how they treated them. He had a forgiving spirit. He did. Jack? No, I think, I know Jesus died for us, but I'm starting to think about the apostles all died for Jesus in a sense. The word. They did. They did. And John was the only one that died of natural causes. All the rest were crucified or killed in one way or another. Yeah. So, good point. All right, so, <clears throat> Job was said to be a perfect and upright man in all his ways. And that's what we would find if we read Job 27, verse 6, which will not go there. But Job evidently lived up to his conscience and it had a sense of a cleansed conscience there's no doubt that Job was suffering a great deal if you can imagine boils all over your body so much so that you couldn't even bear to sit down it was so painful if you can imagine your wife who you loved dearly that cursed him and told him to die his friends, closest friends, began to walk away from him when they had nothing to do with him. But Job never lost his faith because he had a clear conscience. He had a conscience that was a love of God. Any thoughts or comments? All right, a cleansed conscience is one that has been forgiven. Uh, we know that because we go to Acts, the second chapter. And we talk about what was taking place on this day, the day of Pentecost. The day that the Holy Spirit came down on the apostles, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we see the beginning of the church in the second chapter. Uh in Acts, the second chapter, verses 37 and 38. This is when Peter was preaching the sermon. But I want to emphasize that if you really look at the Scriptures and everything, the other apostles were involved in this preaching as well. It wasn't just Peter. Okay? So don't think that Peter was the chosen apostle of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ chose all 12 apostles. And it says, though, in verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now we'll not get into it, but there's been a lot of debate about that gift of the Holy Ghost. And... I'm sad to say that even in the Lord's church, there are people who will get into an argument over whether it was a direct indwelling or an indirect indwelling. And time would not allow us to discuss that. And I don't really care which position you hold. If you want to believe in the direct indwelling, that's okay. If you want to believe in the indirect indwelling, that's okay. But the question is, what are you going to push to other Christians? Because that's not the message that Peter was sending here and the other apostles. The message was, repent and be baptized for remission of your sins. Period. Okay? If you read the rest of the chapter, the second chapter though, I think you'll have a better understanding of what he was talking about, the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, so, any comments? Okay, so, <clears throat> Peter's answer was repent and be baptized in. Without remorse or sorrow for sin and a decision to turn from sin, we cannot have a cleansed conscience. You're not even going to give me five minutes? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, without obedience to the gospel, we cannot have a cleansed conscience. Without a cleansed conscience, we cannot have a good or pure conscience. So, I'm going to give some concluding comments next week, but I will put out 
lesson three here. There's only two pages of lesson three. Arthur, you want to pass this out for me? And we'll talk about lesson three next week. Let me just say while he's passing those out, here's the concluding thoughts of lesson two. A decision that goes against what we would like to do is number one. Number two, or one opposed to the advice of friends or family. Number three, or it may contradict the laws of the people in power, or it may go against the voices of the multitude. So next week we'll talk about the priorities that help us in spiritual growth. Okay? I appreciate your comments and your participation this morning. Four more minutes. He rang two bells. I think I, 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 I'm not sure if it was intentional or they were trying to test to see if they were ready to go. Well, <laughs> you know, it does say we have. To. All right. All right. So let me just, with the concluding thoughts then, let me go back and make a couple of other comments. Uh, but conscience will not withdraw or modify its demands. We may fail to obey the right and give way to the passion, or we may be overwhelmed by allurements. But we can know that we ought to obey. It is our duty to obey. It is our duty to grow spiritually and to grow our conscience. So the question I have is, what kind of conscience do we have? I'm the only one that can answer my conscience, and you're the only one that can answer your conscience. But we can, can we live with the conscience that we have today? Or do we want to make some changes in our life and improve our conscience? Does our conscience bother us, or does it condemn us in any way? Could we say with the Apostle Paul, I have lived in all good conscience unto this day? Yes, Jack. I think we, are, we should all live as good as we can, but strive to do better. Exactly right. Nobody's perfect. No one was perfect. Paul wasn't perfect. Peter wasn't perfect. Peter denied Christ three times. But Peter, even after the day of Pentecost, Peter still made mistakes, didn't he? Mm -hmm. You recall, he was still favoring Jews over Gentiles. And God had to come to him and say, No, I am not a respecter of persons, and you will love the Gentiles as much as you love the Jews. Well, their message, they were supposed to spread the gospel... And Jesus Christ to all men. They were. They were. And Peter learned that lesson. Uh, and the other apostles, obviously, they learned that lesson as well. But they were men. Men make mistakes. I've made my mistakes. You've made your mistakes. But we grow from those mistakes as well. Actually, mistakes are designed to help us grow and mature in the proper way. Nola? The Bible, unlike other history, and we have a history in the Bible, it tells the good and the bad. It does not hide the imperfections of those who were leading in the church. That's true. And we look at <coughs> Old Testament examples. We can look at New Testament examples. But let me just give you one. I want you to think of David. God said David was a man of his after his own heart, didn't he? But think about the sins that David committed as a king. He committed adultery. He had her husband killed, so he was guilty of murder. And yet God said David was a man after his own heart. And if God can feel that way about David, that God can feel that way about us as well, can he? Knowing that we're not perfect, but expecting us to grow in our spiritual growth. But he paid right. a price. Do what? He paid a price. He did. For his wrongdoing. He did. 
And we all are going to pay prices for our wrongdoing. But the question is, do we learn from our wrongdoing? All right, so that truly was the second bell this time. <laughs> and we will look at lesson three next week.